Hello, it's Michael Watts here and welcome to season two of Luthia Stories. This is uh, something that I've been looking forward to saying for so long, not only season two, but what a way to start. I'm here in the beautiful city of Montreal, which has so many wonderful memories for me. And I'm here with my dear friend, Michael Greenfield. Michael, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for coming. Long, long overdue. So we've arranged a selection of some of the most desirable woods currently being used in uh, Lucia made uh, steel string guitars. We're going to go through them one by one, remembering, and this is a point that I've made before, that wood itself is nothing more than a source of potential. <laughs> You and I have shared conversations, and if I'm entirely honest, it's been more of a learning experience uh, for me uh, about wood, and you, you've shared all sorts of uh, concepts with me. Would you give me an overview of uh, your thinking when it comes to the materials you use? Well, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> uh, and I may get myself into a lot of trouble with the internet, and it won't be the first time. Uh, but these are things I'm pretty passionate about. Um, we're living in a time where people who are not instrument makers somehow have become experts in the wood used to craft musical instruments. And even, dare I say, some of the people who are making musical instruments who just don't have the breadth of experience or their understanding of the materials comes from what they've learned on the internet. So that's the preamble to the rant. <laughs> um, as you pointed out in your introduction, the materials in and of themselves do very little. And an analogy that I frequently use is Brazilian rosewood, which we'll get to in a minute. But the analogy is this is supposedly the holy grail mm. of guitar wood. And for a long time, Rosewood guitars were made of Dalberja Negra, which is the particular species of rosewood that comes from Brazil, right? because there are many, um, all of which technically are Brazilian rosewood, yes. but not Dalberja Negra. And it's just because in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, the Europeans and Asians were pillaging South America mm -hmm. and Belize, and that was just, that was rosewood. That's right. what everybody had. And those classic era Martin guitars in the early 20th century washborns and all of the great concert guitars made in the 19th century and before that were made of rosewood, that was rosewood. Mm. It happens to be a fabulous material, but rosewood by itself doesn't make a good guitar. And what does rosewood mean? Which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. But the qualifier is for anybody who's done any serious shopping and or listening and or collecting of handmade guitars, there are many, many, many underwhelming instruments made of Brazilian rosewood. Mm. So in and of itself, it's not the rosewood. It, it's, it's the person who's crafting the guitar. Right. I'm not talking about myself because there are lots of very gifted makers who have the skill set and understanding of the materials to apply them as part of a system which is with the guitar, mm. and craft a superlative musical instrument. You see, this is another aspect of your thinking that I've learned from the guitar as a functioning system where one bit affects the other and, and almost a biome, you know, a delicate mm. balance uh, within. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, uh, well, abs yes, absolutely. I didn't make any of this stuff up. I mean, musical instrument makers have understood this for centuries. Mm. Today we have the discipline of acoustic physics and we have a lexicon to describe these things. We have mathematical formulae to explain these things. We have instruments that can very accurately measure the metrics and mechanics of the materials. But, you know, in the time of Stradivari, he would lay a log on some kind of a support and have his apprentice stand on one side of the log with a hammer and give it a whack and the maestro would be on the other end of the log listening and he was measuring speed of sound. Right. 
you know, and certain things just sounded better. And he went, oh, well, this is going to make good instruments, etc. <laughs> and, you know, they had a profound understanding of the materials because they worked with them. And there was the master apprentice tradition mm -hmm. where the knowledge was passed down. And today that tradition seems to be missing other than a YouTube video which if the, in, if the information wasn't properly vetted to begin with, mm. what is it that you're learning? Well, exactly. Shall we uh, have a look at some Brazilian rosewood to Absolutely. start with? Absolutely. People talk about bell-like wood. It doesn't get any more bell-like. A wooden bell, but... There's one, here's another. You, you can hear, these are very vitreous, dense, not too dense, quite stiff, and they, they make lovely guitars. But there are lots of tone woods. I, uh, that, that term, tone wood, I don't even know what it means. But there's, <laughs> there, there, there's lots of materials that, if properly used to achieve a particular music goal, mm. musical goal, will make a fine instrument. Right. Because you approach the, the creation of a Greenfield guitar from the point of view of the musician's sonic experience. Uh, that's part of it. I approach the crafting of an instrument from the musician's musical needs. Right. So it's what's the repertoire, either in general or specific, because mm -hmm. some players have a collection. They have many arrows in their quiver, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so sometimes they want an instrument to address a particular tuning or a particular voice or a particular application or something for the studio or something for the stage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And after a long consultation process, I have an idea of what the instrument is going to be. And this may or may not be the right choice. I've had customers who call me up and would like Brazilian rosewood and Adirondack red spruce. And I say, great. I said, well, let's have a conversation. And an hour and a half, two hours later into the conversation, it turns out that he really wanted mahogany with red cedar. And I pr assure him and promise him that it will be okay. Mm. And I deliver the guitar and, oh my God, how did you know? That's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so, yeah. And the other end of the equation is many of my customers are collectors mm -hmm. and they know what they want for whatever reason. Some right. of it's collectability, some of it, is, it, it need not be anything more than I like, I really like rosewood guitars. I know I like this, yeah. I would like you to make me a rosewood guitar. Absolutely right. What attributes do you find in Brazilian rosewood that make it so, uh, uh, so valuable, so desirable? These days, it's its preciousness, right. which is why it's desirable to the market. Mm. I don't really look at wood as a species. When I look at a piece of wood, I'm thinking a set of mechanical properties. And, you know, I said, what does Brazilian rosewood even mean? I have, this, this is a fairly middle of the road, I mean, it's a beautiful, but as far as mechanical properties, this is kind of the average. Mm -hmm. I have sets of rosewood that have the density of ebony or African blackwood. I have sets of Brazilian rosewood that have the density of koa. Yeah. It's all Brazilian rosewood. It will make a different sounding guitar. Not better or worse, different. And my view through my experience is that the density of the set of the wood affects the overtone series of the guitar. There isn't bass and treble and all these things. They don't live in tone wood. Oh, no, uh, really? <laughs> really. And, and, you know, people are of the opinion that uh, maple is trebly and crisp. And my rebuttal to that is mm -hmm. the cello. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, the double bass is uh, famed for its crisp treble. That's <laughs> exactly. So, you know, but the contribution of that tone wood to the overall system. I used the word. <laughs> My view is that as the density of the material increases, the attack and decay of the overtone series in the instrument 
increases. So the guitar will have a slower attack and a longer decay, all measured in milliseconds. Mm. Yet it's audible. Of course. It's and it, it, it comes across as the high density woods. Well, you know what? I'll come back to that in a second. And then mm. there are the, I categorize, so I categorize the rosewood family, which I put ebony in and Malaysian blackwood, even though they're not rosewoods. Then there's the mahogany family, you know, koa and the acacias. Koa is an acacia, all of the mahoganies. Mm. And that's a very in the middle right. kind of a thing. Quicker attack, quicker decay. Mm. And then there are the light density woods, maple, Spanish cypress, etc., myrtle mm. wood. And very quick attack, very quick right. decay. So my, my idea of a good term. The High density woods present a very lush, wet, mm. reverby sound, which for certain things, particularly legato players and the melodic players, guys, well, even Pierre, he's playing, Pierre Ben Susan is playing his mahogany guitar again these right. years. But the point is, they present with that very lush overtone series. The mahogany guitars, interestingly enough, favored by bluegrassers. Mm much quicker attack and quicker decay. There's more separation from note to note. There's less conflict between the notes and you're able to voice more complex chords. They record really well, particularly mm. in an ensemble, because it's not competing with the other players mm. and it's not competing with the voice. So mm. singer-songwriters, many of them, whether they realize it or not, really like mahogany guitars because all those lush overtones don't conflict with their own performance. And then finally, on the light end of things, density-wise, are those maple guitars, which you favor, and flamenco players mm. favor because they're median. Right. The note's there, and then it's gone. The player is in complete control over what the instrument has to say. Now, the caveat to that is the great late Paco de Lucia, who was just such, his prowess and his technique and his mastery of the instrument was such that he was able to tame and rein in the overtones of the Brazilian rosewood and make it work for him. Right. Most flamenco players, they want the blanca. Absolutely. You know, and they just want that immediate growl. And then we also have to look at the archtop guitar Mm -hmm. which was made of maple and it was uh, and is or it was a percussion instrument part of the rhythm mm, section yeah, and its job on the bandstand amongst all those other players was to chunk, 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 mm -hmm. chug out complex chords and you could hear all six notes with definition and clarity and separation if you were to try that on a rosewood guitar, it would be a jumbled mess. Very different thing. A very different Absolutely. thing. So they're all good. Mm -hmm. One isn't better than the other. But with that understanding of what wood density brings, well, maybe if the player wants Brazilian rosewood, maybe he wants the one that has the mahogany density. Mahogany. Yes. We should look at mahogany. I happen to have some. <laughs> And mahogany, pretty good because, like you said, normally it thuds like cardboard. You always put together a mahogany back, and you, you tap on it, and you go, "This is going to sound like crap." And mahogany are like my favorite guitars. <laughs> but you've been making guitars from the tree, pretty much for as long as I've known you, which goes uh, back over a decade. Mm. What has using this wood taught you? That's a great question. Um, it's taught me to be careful <laughs> because as everybody probably knows notwithstanding the crazy price tag it's an irreplaceable material mm. there's there's no second chance anybody who's crafted a guitar can only imagine if you haven't what bending sides of this material because all of this figure this is the grain going this way and this way and it, it's ridiculous and then as soon as you apply heat and moisture it just wants to open up mm. and one of my mentors a renowned guitar maker had a request to make an instrument of the tree and he procured some wood and 
I'm very flattered that at this point in his career, he's calling me just to share information. I'm not giving him mm -hmm. advice, but what tips could I give him? So I told him, and he had a hell of a time. It was a nightmare. He completed the guitar, of course, and I'm sure it was perfect because that's what his work mm -hmm. is like. Um, and afterwards he said, I'll never build with it again. Um, so I've developed a few techniques to carefully bend the wood so that I haven't I haven't lost the set of wood yet. Um, it might happen, but hopefully it won't. Um, so the the preciousness of the material is one thing. Interestingly enough, how do I put this into words? As I said at the beginning, it's mahogany. Mm. It does mahogany. Right. The guitar, as I said, it only understands density, and, mm. and this is mahogany. Having said that, this is that old Belizean mahogany that the Gibson Guitar Company was right. using in the 1920s and yes. 30s in the classic era, um, which is different than, it, it's the same species, I think, mm. like botanically, but the density and the properties of this wood is different than the rose than the mahogany oh, absolutely. that's that's available today so this reminds me a lot of that earlier mm. mahogany and then there's an added something right and the something is the quilt yes and whether it's on an arch top guitar or a flat top guitar the reality is that the quilt ruins the mechanical property of the wood. Right. All of the structural and integrity of the, the, this material has been compromised mm. because the grain is no longer continuous. Right. And all those fibers are no longer lining up there. Mm. It's chaotic, isn't it's, it? It's a good word. It's chaotic, exactly. So, you know, we have to take other measures to stabilize it. And, and it's fine, it's stable. I'm not worried about it structurally, but I am concerned about the oscillation of, of, of the wood and the excursion of mm. the plate. Right. So this tends to be more active mm. than a regular set of straight grain mahogany. So this is what we're dealing with, with a bit of shellac on. So you can see the extraordinary quilting. I put out a video on the tree and immediately the challenge that I get, and anybody who talks about the tree for more than about 37 seconds on Instagram um, gets, is well, you know, wood's all the same. I can discern a similarity in guitars from the tree. And I believe that is not because they're made out of mahogany necessarily, but it's the same similarity that I might expect to discern in instruments made from the same organism. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I ascribe it to. I would go as far as that. Well, the way I think of it is this is higher density mahogany right. than typical mahogany. Greater overtone series, mm. slightly slower attack. Uh, it's much closer to koa than to modern mahogany. Right. And then the quilt, it gives it a little bit more compliance than a more straight grained traditional mm -hmm. set of mahogany. So slightly more responsive with a more pronounced and lush overtone series. Do you enjoy building with it? Yes. I, I mean, I always stressed when it's time to bend uh, the wood and, and fabricate the, the rim assembly. But I, I mean, look at it. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and people always go, ooh, ah, mm -hmm. I did nothing. <laughs> you know, I glued it together and I planed it and scraped it and made it all nice and smooth and pretty and then I applied some finish to it and made it shiny. But this is Mother Nature. It just came right out of the tree, pun intended. This is some spectacular Pernambuco. I was able to find three sets of this quality a few years back. All three have been sold. Um, what I know of it is that it's scarce mm. and precious. The trees are very small. Right. And it's usually used in the crafting of bows, violin bows, mm. because of its 
sonic and mechanical properties. So to find boards large enough to saw guitar sets out of is kind of a unicorn. Absolutely. And here we have a two-piece back big enough for a 16-inch guitar. And I, I mean, it goes off quarter a little bit over here, which isn't bad. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's the back. It's not a mm -hmm. soundboard. But so much of this is straight grain. I mean, this is like, as soon as I saw it, I went, yes, please. <laughs> so, you know, I'm right now I'm crafting the first of the three guitars out of it. It should mm -hmm. be ready in, I don't know, five months, four months, because we're part way into the build. I'll let you know what I think at the end, but I know just from, you know, handling the material, mm. it's it's very very dense. It's very vitreous. Uh, it's quite stiff, so it has high modulus. And we did measure it, and the speed of sound is very fast. So, y you know, when you do the little ping test after, it it really rings in a very musical way. One thing that we have to watch out for when we're talking about Pernambuco, of course, is that it is the real thing. Because the Pernambuco from which Brazil takes its name right. is one tree. Right. And in the same <laughs> same thing where you said there are rosewoods from Brazil right. that are not Stalvesia Negra. Right. There's also any number of yeah. Pernambucos and Palisandras yeah. that that could claim Again, to be the same thing. I, I, I agree, and I, I do know that. Uh, but my experience with this wood is limited just because I'm dealing with set number one. It's going to be fun, though, isn't it? It's already fun. It's already fun. <laughs> it, it, it was fun when I came across the material uh, yeah. three years ago, four years ago. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and it's been sitting here. It, it was sold immediately, but my waiting list is so long. It's taken till now before I could actually craft the instrument. This is a Pisia abis. Right. This is a red spruce that grows in the Alps mm -hmm. in Europe. This is yeah. European spruce. And this happens to have been harvested in Switzerland right. because the trees don't really know if they're in Germany or the Italian Alps oh, they or the don't. Swiss. They no, don't they're just kind oh. of growing, doing okay. their thing. <laughs> this particular wood is harvested by a family that furnishes stringed instrument makers and has for several generations. And they harvest it according to the lunar cycles of the moon which is a very traditional way of harvesting wood for musical instruments. Uh, whether or not the cycle of the moon actually makes a difference, I don't know. Uh, is the sap really lower in the tree? I think it's lower in the tree more because it's traditionally harvested in the dead of winter when the tree is asleep and right, dormant, dormant yeah. you know, uh, because frankly, in the middle of February, when it's minus 20 and you're at 6,000, whatever, you yeah. know, 3,000 meters, I, I think February, January, beginning of March, it's all the same. It's not a massive I stretch think. of the imagination, is it? I mean, my stuff's fairly low in those conditions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Having said that, that which is truly important is the Sawyer, who is selecting the tree, who is mm. felling the tree, and how. And then more important, how is the wood bucked up and then split and then subsequently split again and then sawn into sets, etc. And then of course, chosen. Um, I mean, we're, we can open a can of worms. So this is yes, please. <laughs> Swiss Alpen spruce moon spruce, in air quotes. I really like this material. It's very stiff across the grain and light, which is good. Mm. For other things, it's the wrong choice. I no longer talk about spruce when I'm talking to my customers. We'll talk about the instrument and then I'll select right. spruce. Mm. There's no upcharge, it, whether it's Adirondack spruce or Alpin spruce or uh, Sitka spruce, which I love. 
uh, or um, lutes, which I also really like a lot. I have quite a bit of it. It doesn't matter. What matters, just like the back and sides, what's the density of the wood? What's its mechanical property? We, I think I saw it on this side. This is off the saw. This has been sanded because we measure. Mm. So these measurements are telling me what its density is, what the volume of the wood is, what its uh, speed of sound is with and across the grain, uh, what its modulus elasticity is with and across the grain. And then we have some ratios, some equations that we've devised that sort of give it an overall score, which is really all meaningless. Uh, I've been doing this for quite a few years now. I still don't really understand it. But, you know, when you do research, that's kind of the challenge, is not mm -hmm. to go in with preconceived notions. Me take measurements, accrue a data set, and let the data explain itself to you. Right. So that's what I'm trying to do. What I'm starting to learn is that a high score for one set of wood might, or not even might, is not a high score for another set of wood. So for moon spruce, I was hesitant, I, I put it in mm -hmm. air quotes, for this alpine spruce, the number for this, if I was to look at the number from Adirondack spruce, you'd go, oh, that's terrible. Yeah, if it was this, but for right. Adirondack spruce, because it's so much heavier, uh, it's a different set of numbers. So we're creating our own data set and set of metrics that we look at. Uh, so yeah, this has already been sanded. This is off the saw, but you know, I could see the, the amount of silk and cross grain medullary rays is crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's perfectly quarter sawn, and you know, I can't tell until it's completely sanded. But I'm not seeing any run out in this set of wood, and. This is a wonderful segue to talk about grading. Yes. So let's talk about master grade wood. Yes. Ooh. Okay, so I'll get back to this particular set in a moment. Every guitar maker on the planet is building with master grade wood. Please explain to me how that works. <laughs> you know, truly master grade, or, or let me say it this way. I went to a wood supplier in Europe. I won't say where. Uh, I spent a day there with a friend of mine, and without exaggeration, I must have gone through 500 sets of wood, and I did not leave with one, mm -hmm. not one. Uh, and I was ready to buy 100 sets, right. but not a, not a single one. In fact, you know what, first time I visited, which is going back now to 2009, mm -hmm. I saw a box of tops arrive. You mm -hmm. had a stack of them, I think it was something like 50. And while we were talking, you were, mm -hmm. I think you pulled out two and put them to one side. And as we were talking, you were packing the box up ready to, yeah. to send it back. Yeah, that's kind of my joke that's not a joke. Whenever I deal with a new supplier, I tell them, why don't you pick out 100 tops and send me the 10 I'm not going to return to you? <laughs> and they go, ha, 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 ha. And then I order 20 tops and I send 15 back. Right. And you do that a couple of times, not to be a, an asshole, but... They just go, oh, okay, this this guy knows what he wants. It's managing expectations, isn't it? That's their job, to manage the yes, expectations. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but wood is graded on aesthetic. It's not graded on its mechanical properties. And truly, master grade, which I'll come back to that definition in a moment, is less than 1% of the harvest. So mm -hmm. how could it be that every set of wood is master grade? Right. Now, for me, master grade is not tight grain. You know, I, I look for wood that's, I don't know, 14 to 18 grains per inch. Uh, and there have been scientific papers written about this, uh, mm -hmm. and that's been corroborated. Uh, it, it speaks better. When you have super tight grained wood, I find the voice choked. Right. Uh, that's me, in the mm. way I build. Other people maybe build fabulous guitars. I don't want to take anything away from anybody. But um, this particular piece of wood is graded double A, triple A. So it's above double A, it's below triple A. I order a lot of this stuff because I find 
the best wood in this category. The master grade wood, I've rejected. Mm -hmm. And it's like a crazy amount of money, which is just, I feel irresponsible because I respect the material too much not to use it, but it wouldn't make as good a guitar as this. Mm. And the reality is, yes, this is less expensive, and yes, it's a lower grade, so I do reject a lot of it. I don't return it, it's just like I buy it with that understanding. So it probably ends up being about the same cost per set, but I'm finding really stiff across grain and with grain. It's light, it has, well, I just said it has a high modulus. Speed of sound is good. These are very well sawn, so there's almost no run out. I think we're getting to the point in time where run out is going to have to become an acceptable thing just mm. because the spruce trees are going away. You know, just to deviate for a second, equatorial rainforest wood, you know, in 50 mm -hmm. years you can grow a tree big enough to, you know, make a guitar out of. In spruce you're talking four to six hundred years. Right. So, you know, they're cutting down all the spruce trees and making pulp out of it as opposed to musical instruments, but that's another conversation. So I'm very fortunate to have cultivated a relationship with this family in Switzerland. I buy a lot of wood from them. I also love Sitka spruce, which I buy from, you know, the uh, western coast of this continent. And uh, like the back and side material, all of these woods have their mechanical properties. I keep repeating that, but that's what it's all about. And somebody who has a very strong right hand who wants to be a flat picker, I might make one choice. And somebody who wants to be James Taylor with a fairly mm -hmm. light attack in the right hand, it would be another choice. I'm a poser, man. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> I would like to qualify that the top wood, the top plate, whether it's cedar or the spruces, just like these exotic tropical woods, in and of themselves do not make great instruments. The craftsperson has to have an understanding of the wood and its properties to know what they're looking for. Mm not necessarily an aesthetic, although it's important. I don't want ugly wood, you know, in, in quotes, mm -hmm. but I, I want, first and foremost, a, a set of wood that's going to make a fabulous musical instrument. But then it comes down to the experience of the maker, who has a clear vision of the desired outcome of the guitar, the result, who has enough experience working with the materials that can steer and manipulate the properties of the material to achieve that musical goal. Musical being the operative word. What, what you've shared with me today, Michael, demonstrates very clearly that there are no shortcuts uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. That may be quite disheartening for luthiers that are towards the beginning of their journey. What advice would you have? For, uh, for fledgling the, luthiers? Yes. Build a lot of guitars. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm humbled. I receive a lot of email from, I don't know, yeah, let's just call them fledgling luthiers, newbies, uh, around the planet. You know, what should I do? What advice can you give me? And, you know, frankly, it's overwhelming. I get such a, a huge amount of email, and I do try to answer all of them, but I just can't. Uh, my answer is the same. You, you just build 50 guitars and then build 100 guitars. You know, keep copious, copious notes. I, I mean, as you saw, I'm recording all kinds of data in all kinds of journals all the way through the process, and you will see trends develop. That's why I said I don't know what all of this means right now, but you know, it's been 100 guitars maybe more that I've been recording the data. And it sounds like a lot, but it's only a hundred guitars. Mm. But if you build 10 guitars, you record the data, you'll start to see some trends. So based on those trends, then you steer your process in that direction. You build 10 more guitars. 
and then you see what those trends are, et cetera, et cetera. There's no shortcut. Right. You have to do the work. You have to build the guitars, and all the secrets will reveal themselves to you. And you know, go to a museum. Go, you know, mm. there's there's nothing new. It's all been done. Beautiful. Michael Greenfield, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for coming. It's been wonderful. Thank you.